Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius, the official energy drink of PewterReport.com. Hope everybody had a great weekend. It is a new week of episodes of the Pewter Report podcast. Starting off with Monday, we will have roll call in about 17 minutes. Lot to get to on today's show. The Bucks off-season program began. So more Bucks players are in the building. We spoke to three of them today. Plus, there was a little bit of breaking news that just popped yeah. off literally three minutes ago. Not even. So we're going to talk about that breaking news right now as well. I'm your host, Matt Matera. Joined with me is my fellow colleague from PewterReport.com, Adam Slaban. Adam, how are we doing? We're doing great, Matt. And there's been a lot of good vibes in the air in Tampa Bay recently. Whether it was uh, the birthdays of Chase Edmonds, Baker Mayfield, Kate Otten. Yeah. Uh, Justin Wirfs and Baker Mayfield having kids to now the first day of voluntary workouts. And also the latest news. Just a lot of good vibes, a lot of good energy feeding off that. And only 10 days until the NFL draft. Yes. Very exciting times. Uh, good on you for pointing that out. We're going to get to Redfish's Super Chat in just a moment. But let's get to this breaking news. Returning back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is Will Golston, the defensive tackle, the longtime Buccaneer outside of Levante David. I don't think anyone's been on the Bucs for longer then Will Golston had an interception last year, yeah. a part of that defensive tackle rotation. Bucks bring back a very familiar face, and they add to the defensive line just a little bit more. So initially off the bat, Adam, your first reaction. Well, I think it's a very good like quality depth signing. Uh, Golston at this point in his career, he's not much more than a rotational defensive lineman but he still provides a lot of value, not just in the locker room, but he also played some of his best football down the stretch. As you mentioned, that interception, he got a lot of reps, and he's just a great veteran and kind of glue guy to have. Now, I don't think it's going to change the team's plans regarding getting another defensive lineman in the draft, but off the bat, you kind of like it. It's not going to be the re-signing that sparks the boat parade, but yeah. it's a quality move. Yeah, it's certainly just something to have with a familiar face, a guy that's been in the area, been in the locker room for a very long time. His role has diminished throughout the years. I mean, we're talking about two seasons in a row where Will Golston did not have a sack. So he's gone sackless the last two seasons, um, played in 16 games last year, started one. But you got to remember in 2022, he started nine games in 2021. He started 10. So he went from 19 starts over the last two seasons to just one last year. And I think that was more of a product of the injury to Kalijah Kansi, who we'll talk about, and some of the other uh, injuries that went on. Will Golson had 19 combined tackles last year, 10 solo and nine assisted tackles. Of course, the big play for him was the interception that happened on the Thursday night game against the Buffalo Bills. I'm trying to pull up on the fly his uh, snap percentage. Yeah, so that was another thing as well. So last season, as far as defensive snaps, he only had 244 defensive snaps. That was good for 23% of those snaps. And again, in comparison to really the last two years where I'd say the Bucs started kind of, you know, going in a little bit of a different direction with Will Golson, obviously still using him, but not as much. 2021, he had 44% of the snaps and 507 total. Um, and 2022, 43% of the snaps and 485. So he's been playing less and less each season. I don't think, and you kind of already said it, Adam, I, I don't know how much this really changes for the Bucks' plans at defensive tackle. I don't think it precludes them from still taking one, really, in, in any round. And while Will's here... I don't even necessarily know if that means he's going to play. Again, if he played 23% of the snaps last season, you would have to imagine it'll probably be around that number or even less. So I'm not knocking the move. I just think it's more for a depth piece. And let's just face it, a fan favorite, a guy that yeah, you know, I, sure. I enjoy talking to, great quote in the locker room, and um, I think it'll be somewhat enjoyable. Yeah, I agree. Kind of have to wonder, though, I, I was kind of thinking it heading into this season that last year was his last hurrah. 
But as you mentioned, with the diminished playing time, if this is really Golston's last season with the Bucs. Yeah, you never know. I always felt, because Will Golston's always been with the Buccaneers, but he's also, um, he's from Michigan. He played at Michigan State. I always felt, and obviously every every team is different, every defense is different, but I always felt that maybe he would end up going to the Lions at some point because, like, he's from that area. The Lions are a competitive team. It would make a lot of sense for him to go there, especially on a cheap deal and, um, you know, be close to family and everything like that. So that crossed my mind, but who knows? I mean, I think Will's going to want to play for as long as he possibly can. And like I said, good guy in the locker room. So certainly not too much against it if he's not going to be the focal point of the defensive line after Vita Vea and Kalijah Kansi, and we'll see what's up with uh, Logan Hall. The other signing that the Bucs made, um, they have signed – an international offensive lineman. He did play at the University of Cincinnati, so he's not exactly new to America. But they signed Lorenz Metz, who uh, you love played... that last name. Yes, let's go Metz. Um, Metz. This is Metz with a Z, not a S, like the even cooler. Um, not as cool. Um, he got introduced to American football at the age of eighteen. Lorenz Metz. He's from Bavaria, Germany. So kind of just. Learning about him on the fly. He's getting a second shot at the NFL. This is all on the Buccaneers website. Um, he does not count against the 90-man offseason roster. He last year signed with the Chicago Bears as an undrafted free agent in May. Was released before training camp and got a tryout with the Giants. But he was not on a team in 2023. So... You know, this is a signing. He's going to get an opportunity in OTAs. Hopefully gets to training camp, but bit of an international signing you know the nfl is big with you know trying to install the international program they obviously play a lot of games overseas now so another move by the tampa bay buccaneers don't necessarily know that uh that's going to be a needle mover by any yeah. means but lorenz metz your newest tampa bay buccaneer along with will ghoston and you Let's, never know, Matt, he could be a spielmacher. He could be a spielmacher, of course, for those that don't recall. Uh, that's how you say playmaker in German. And we used that word a lot when the Bucs were in Germany two seasons ago when the Bucs played against the Seattle Seahawks. Remember, that was a crazy game. The Bucs won, yeah. which was nice. Julio Jones had a touchdown. Tom Brady went out for a pass, um, and it ended up getting intercepted. Dave Canales, of course, at that time was – on the Seahawks offensive coaching staff. And what else happened? Rashad White had a uh, big time game as well. He did, but that's stiff arm. Talk, we're, yeah, we're going to talk about Rashad White soon. But yeah, that was a pretty crazy game in Germany, was it not? Yeah, and it seems like to continue having ripple effects on the Bucs too, because now they got a German player. And what's most intriguing about Metz, he's six foot nine. That might be like the tallest player in the NFL, like just yeah. another uh, kind of developmental offensive lineman who might pan out. Yeah, you'll see. It's very low risk, high reward type of situation. Um, we kind of know what it looks like with the Buccaneers offensive line. Hey, who knows? I also feel like we do have OTAs coming up and Bucks rookie mini camp is around the corner and everything like that after the draft. But what can you really learn from an offensive lineman in yeah. OTAs where there's no physical contact or anything like that? But anyway. Just curious about that. Let's get to this super chat from Rev Fish, a.k.a. Mark Fisher. Thank you very, very much for this $4.99 super chat. Remember, if you super chat us, any type of compensation does not matter if it's a dollar or if it's $100. If you super chat us, we make sure that we get to your comments or question. And, of course, you get to cut the line. We got a lot of great people. Can't get to every single comment from everybody. But if you super chat us... Rest assured, we will get to your comments. So, Redfish says, Last year, we exceeded expectations. As we look to this year, do you think our play exceeded or met our talent? Do you feel we played over our heads? He puts that in quotations. As we look to this year, do you think our play... I'm a slightly confused by the question just because do you want us to look back at last season and but the expectations were already made that there weren't very high expectations. Yeah. 
So that's what I'm a little confused about. Um, last year, we exceeded expectations. As we look to this year, do you think our play exceeded or met our talent from last year? Or I guess in other words, the way to say this is, can the Bucks continue to do what they did last season? I don't necessarily think the Bucs played over their heads. I think they played right. pretty much to their ability. Let's remember, they went 9-8. and eight. It wasn't like they dominated the division, won double digits, and, you know, everything like that. So I think the Bucs are right on track, in my opinion. I think Baker needs to continue his play, maybe even get a little bit better. I think at least consistent from Baker. That's really what I, what I want to see the most. I think um, that Redfish continues. Yes, looking back at last year, do you think we caught lightning in a bottle, or do you feel that we were really as good as we showed it at the end of the year? Thank you for uh, repurposing yeah. that question as well. I mean, again, there was a time the Bucks lost, what, six in a row, seven in a row, six of their last seven? So I think they took advantage of a, a, a really rapidly declining Eagles team in that first round of the playoffs. But again, at the same time, they hung with the Lions until very end into the game. Like at the very end, they were still very close. So I think they pretty much played to their talents. Like I said, Baker needs to be more consistent. The Chris Godwin needs to take a step up. Rashad White looked rip roaring, ready to go today, yeah. uh, speaking to him. And the defense is certainly going to look new. I don't necessarily know better. I don't know worse, but it's going to look new because you're going to have Jordan Whitehead at safety. You're going to have a new starting inside linebacker. You have a new starting outside linebacker as well. So new sometimes can be better. Um, but also this is a defense that we won't be as familiar with compared to years past. But what do you think, Adam? Yeah, I agree with a lot of your assessment there. When you look at last season, I feel like from an outside perspective, the Bucs definitely exceeded expectations. They hit the over on their win total. They made it to the divisional round when many pegged them for a top 10 pick. When it comes to actually how the season played out, I thought they went through a roller coaster of a season, you know, starting three and one, losing six to seven. But they caught lightning in a bottle, but it didn't just happen. It wasn't like magic. It was a season-long progression of the offense under Dave Canales, really building and kind of learning the scheme and really operating well. You saw Baker Mayfield play his best football and kind of overcome some of the early season struggles. When you look ahead at next year, I yeah. feel like, as you mentioned, with the new starters on defense, they kind of hit the refresh button. But I do think, having made it to the divisional round, the expectations are a little bit higher that the Bucks should at least make the playoffs, right? After yeah. getting to the divisional round, they should be a formidable formidable threat against the Falcons. And it's going to be those two competing in the NFC South. But when you look back at last year, they had a really solid season, but I don't think they exceeded their own expectations. They came in knowing that they were the same team as they were with Tom Brady, and they played to that level. I think if you look at the offense and the defense, if you had to say one needs a fresh start and the other needs to keep going on the same trajectory. I think you would say the defense, let's strip it down and kind of start over again while keeping core pieces and the offense kind of keep doing what you're doing because the offense yeah. was great in the postseason. I, I know Baker Mayfield threw the interception at the end, but they were scoring, they were moving the ball. The defense was fantastic against the Eagles, but you know, the lines have been an issue for Todd Bowles in that defense. <laughs> Jared Goff specifically has really been an issue. So I think if anything, if, if it was the other way around, I'd be more concerned about this Bucks team. If the defense just kind of continued with the same group and the same idea and everything like that, and the offense completely had to start over again, I think I'd be way more worried about the team than currently where they are, which is Baker and Mike Evans in year two, Baker and everyone really in year two, an offense that is changing, but changing for the better without also drastically altering every single thing that needs to be done in the offense and the defense. Like, what are we going to see? That's going to improve. Uh, Antoine Winfield jr. Has a better running mate with him at safety with Jordan Whitehead. And that's yeah. no disrespect. Well, 
I'm not trying to disrespect anyone, but clearly there was issues at safety after Anton Winfield Jr. last season, which, by the way, he was an all-pro safety. You're probably going to have a better pass rush on the outside because you're going to get a full season of Yaya Diaby starting and a newcomer on the other side of outside linebacker, whether it's Randy Gregory, whether it's a first-round pick, something like that. So the pass rush should be a little bit better. Plus, you get... Um, Zion McCollum starting full time versus Zion moving from side to side. So I think there is a, um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of, a lot of things to like about this new defense. Uh, Nathan says, say it, say it. Ryan Neal sucked eggs. Yeah, he did not play well last season. He sucked. Uh, no offense to him though. I did like Ryan Neal the person, but he sucked. He yeah. sucked for the Bucks last year. Uh, Beach McGee, thanks for the five dollar super chat. What's your thoughts on corners Kyrie Jackson and Cam Hart? Both stand at 6'3 and 6'4. Jackson, Jackson stock could be rising. I was a huge fan of Kyrie Jackson, especially at the Senior Bowl. I think he's got great length and size. I loved how he faced every wide receiver right up in their grill. A lot of the time stayed for them, stayed with them, stride for stride. I'm a big, big fan of Kyrie Jackson. Uh, and then also seeing him at the Combine. He's a guy that doesn't take crap from no one. When he got asked the typical question of like, who do you model your game after? He said, I don't really watch anyone right now, but I love Deion Sanders and I love Darrell mm -hmm. Revis. I loved that answer. Just looking at the all time greats, kind of forgetting about players in the moment. So um, Kyrie Jackson, I'm a big fan of. I would love for the Bucs to draft him. It just, again, comes down to who's available at the right time and what positions yeah. of, uh, of need that the Bucs have. And I actually was a big fan of Cam Hart's game uh, at the Senior Bowl. I thought he was really physical at the line of scrimmage, not really giving the receivers much separation. And I thought he tested pretty well. Uh, when you look at the next level, though, I do like Kyrie Jackson, just based on the fact of the level of competition that he had to face. Faced yes. Washington a couple times last year and held his own against like Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk. I think both of them are going to be good corners and maybe day two targets. Yeah, I, I definitely think I was thinking Kyrie Jackson for round two, of course. So definitely um, something to keep in mind. One thing that we keep in mind every single Monday show at 420, and we're on time for this one. Yeah, so if you got it. Uh, we do roll call every single Monday or the first show of the week. For those that may be new to the show, we do this every week on the show where one of us starts talking about the Buccaneers going one way or another. Um, in the meantime, while I'm talking about the Bucks, Adam's going to put on the uh, screen where you guys are watching from. So start giving us your location. We'll start giving you guys a shout out. Um, yeah, we love our fans. We love doing this every single week. And it's a great way for us to interact with you guys. So, Adam, let's have that. And I'm going to start talking about your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So, it was the uh, first day of the offseason program. A lot of Bucks were joining. Today, Tristan Wirth, the new dads, Tristan Wirfs and Baker Mayfield were, um, were all in attendance. A lot of other Buccaneers. And we got to speak to three Buccaneers today. It was Rashad White. It was uh, Zion McCollum. And rounding it out, last but not least, was Kalijah Kansi. So, I'm going to start off with Rashad White because he has some things that I absolutely loved that he said today. I'm going to get to the first video and then I'm going to read the quote as well so you guys all um, know what's good. Yeah, I don't know. I just remember the Falcons game. It's like the Falcons game. I, I um, had like almost 100 scrimmage yards that game, but yeah. I started getting the space. Uh, I just kind of started realizing. Um, and, um, you know, obviously I took it as a uh, as a disrespect for that. Like, you know, obviously a game plan, guys, was a key for me. Obviously, you be a player, you want to be a guy in this league. You want to be a guy that's scouted for, respected. Yeah. Uh, so I just kind of seen that, and people would just leave me, on, like, you know, and so I was like, I got to make the most and make, make people fear me, make people respect me and say, you know, when they come into a game, it's not just 13, 14. It's one we need to worry about, too. So I said that was a big game, the Falcons game, and after that, like, it was kind of just rolling. It's yeah. nonstop from there. Yeah, so the context of that question, I believe it was from Rick Stroud of the Tampa Bay Times. Um, he was really just asked about when he felt there was a turning point in the season for himself. 
Uh, when he really felt he started like gelling in that offense. And obviously Rashad White was a big part of the Bucks offense. So yes. that's where he was talking about the Falcons game. He said, uh, I just remember the Falcons game. I had uh, almost 100 scrimmage yards. He's talking about the first Falcons game as well, where Tampa Bay actually lost in, ta- uh, in Tampa to uh, the Falcons in that one. I had like almost 100 scrimmage yards that game, but I started getting the space. I just kind of started realizing, obviously, I took it as disrespect for that, for them like not really paying attention to him. Um, obviously, a game plan, guys weren't keen for me. Uh, you want to be a player. You want to be a guy in this league. You want to be a guy that's scouted for, respected. So I just kind of seen that people just leave me out. Like uh, I got to make the most and make people fear me. This is the line I like the most. I got to make the most of it and make people fear me, make people respect me. When they come into a game, it's not just 13, Mike Evans, 14, Chris Godwin. There's more we need to worry about. So I'll say that. That was a big game, the Falcons game. And after that, it was just kind of rolling nonstop from there. And he really did start hitting his stride. He came very close. The two Falcons games really were great for him because he had over 100 yards total in um, that second game against the Falcons. And then the next week was the Green Bay game where obviously he had the big touchdown as a receiver. And I think Rashad White should start getting a little bit more respect. I get that he did not have a thousand rushing yards last season, but he did a lot as a receiver and I think made the most of his situation with really just a bad run game for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And remember, this was also his first full year as a starting running back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was in a, you know, shareholder situation the year before with Leonard Fournette. This is his first time to really kind of let him fly on his own um, as a starter. And also another interesting thing going into this season is this is Rashad White's third year with the Bucs. Going back to his time with Arizona State, he's only there for two seasons. So he said since high school, this is the first time that he uh, has been in a place for like three years or longer. So I think that comfortability is really starting to kind of uh, – seek through as well for Rashad White. And he was like, what, fourth or fifth in the league in combined yards amongst running backs last year? Like, he was yeah. able to do some work for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, I'm even more excited for what he can do after uh, talking with Liam Cohen. Anything to say? <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to play the video. Uh, when oh, he was no. talking like about meeting with Liam Cohen, but really just being excited when they had their meeting today and Liam Cohen was placing a strong emphasis on the running game. I think that kind of speaks volumes about the emphasis that the Bucks want to put on the run game into next season with Rashad White, whether or not he's a bell cow is another question. I kind of feel like Rashad White, he might be best utilized in a situation kind of like Alvin Kamara when he started his career. I yeah. was looking at it. The two best seasons that Kamara had were when he had 187 and 194 carries. Rashad White last season had 272 carries. He had to tote the rock, and that's not to mention uh, being involved in the passing game. He had over 330 touches. So mm-hmm. when you look at it, you kind of want to add another running back to the room. But for having a last-ranked rushing offense last season, Rashad made a lot of big plays. You mentioned the Green Bay game. Uh, there was a play that comes to mind. I forget which game it was when he had like a 42 yard screen touchdown. I think Baker it was Mayfield... San Francisco. Yeah, I think you're right. When he was just kind of looking for somebody, dumped it off to Rashad and he scored. I feel like Rashad has a lot of value, but you may want to tone down his usage just a little bit. Yeah. All right, let's get to a couple of videos. We'll start with uh, his conversation with Liam Cohen. Uh, I know some other people on the show love to say Liam Neeson, but it is Liam Cohen. Uh, we'll talk about that new running game. Uh, yeah, so just our first meeting with Coach Lim this morning. Uh, just great energy, uh, great guy, great human being. Uh, just very smart. So um, you know, he's just talking about the different things that we want that we're gonna do, want to do, uh, get guys in certain positions, certain space. Um, he already know like a lot of coverages that we see. So I mean, obviously the biggest emphasis that we all put on it, and what he started the meeting off with is run game. Uh, run game been bad. 
bad here uh, for I don't know how many years now, but been a few years plus. So uh, that's our biggest emphasis. And with that, just efficiency. So we want to be well efficient. And then everything else going, you know, Mike, Chris, all our receivers going to keep doing what they're doing. And uh, running backs going to be extension to that. But he put a great emphasis on run game here. Of course, a uh, big thing that could help the run game is they're going to do less 12 personnel, which is two tight ends, and stick more to 11 personnel, which is one tight end and three wide receivers. That makes for lighter boxes, you know, up at the line of scrimmage with the linebackers not packing as close to the line of scrimmage, which really could help the run game. And these were Rashad's comments about it. Might present some lighter boxes for you to run yeah. against. What are your thoughts on, on that possibility? Um, yeah, so uh, it's tough. You know, I love my tight ends for sure, yeah. so I won't just do that. But uh, it's just whatever coach thinks is best for us to win um, and put guys in the best position possible. Um, so, yeah, um, a lot what the Rams could do is 11 personnel, things like that. I mean, you got Puka, he like 6'2", two, whatever, 2-something. Two mm -hmm. So he big guy. But uh, just certain things we got here at the receivers that block. I mean, but he also showed us like two sets of like tight ends and things like that, just different stuff we can run uh, that's way different than uh, what we was running last year and uh, I'm not trying to take a knock on anybody but uh, it was very exciting for all of us and just the emphasis like the whole meeting was based on just run game and then obviously he showed different variations because we got different coaches from all over the place Miami things like that so he showed stuff to get our receivers I mean you know just in different looks coverages that guys run against us like Mike and what he's been seeing for years over his career and how he can put him in a better position Chris guys like that so uh, it was awesome honestly outside getting flexed out against linebackers in this offense? Yeah, so um, I'm for sure looking forward to that. Obviously, I do want to be out in space a lot. Um, like you guys said, I feel like uh, I thrive well, obviously, out in space. Um, I think, like I said, Liam showed clips of that, too. Um, over time, even he wasn't there, but like Ty Gurley, just guys in the West Coast offense. I mean, Henderson, we've seen guys catching touchdowns out wide and empty, you know, matched up against our linebackers. So, of course, that's huge and things like that. And as well as just learners. So, yeah, I'm excited for that. Uh, I mean, I will be prepared for that for sure, and I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. So, we'll see whether or not <clears throat> Rashad White is the bell cow, if something else is going to happen in the Bucks running back room. Obviously, they re-signed Chase Edmonds. Sean Tucker is there. How much he'll play remains to be seen. But, Adam, just curious, if the Bucks do – go with another running back in this year's draft. What style of running back is, is kind of best for this situation? That's a great question. And it was something that Rashad was kind of asked today about like the thunder and lightning dynamic where Rashad's more the lightning guy, the elusive running back. Could they get a thunder guy, like somebody like a power yeah. back or a goal line back? I actually think that would be a great compliment to Rashad's game. I don't see him as somebody on like third and two, fourth and one. You want to give him the ball? I think somebody more stocky, a better built would kind of be an option. I know AJ Dillon was a free agent. He might have fit that role. Yeah. Uh, Braylon Allen in the draft, he could be a potential option. Or somebody kind of along the lines of Rashad White, but maybe more uh, of a focus in one area, like Marshawn Lloyd uh, from USC. Yeah. Somebody that he could fit and kind of fill that receiving role that Rashad does. But somebody maybe to have the same talent level in certain areas but just giving Rashad a break in, like, some regard. Yeah, I think more physical is the way to go. Not that Rashad isn't. I want someone that you're not going to have to think about twice yeah. in the short yardage situations where the Bucks have had their issues. So Rashad was asked that today. If they were going to get someone to compliment him, what's the best way to compliment him? I'm not the perfect back. I mean, I try to model myself to be perfect. I try to model myself to like not have coach take me off the field. Like I said, obviously the biggest thing in my career is just being efficient. Um, everybody got their opinion on me. Can I run through tackles? Can I not? Um, you know, it is what it is. But uh, I just think um, if they draft a back, just draft a guy that like going to fit the mode of our running back room. I mean, we work in there, but we all great human beings. We, um, you know, we, we pride ourselves off of being that first great man. Um, and um, the biggest thing, just come in, he ready to compete. and. Um, at the end of the day, he's just challenging each one of us to, to get better. So I, I would say the biggest thing, too, and just understanding, too, like to work on this game. Like, I'm working on my game. I'm still working on it. Like, I'm not perfect, like I said. But uh, I, I, I really can't, like, tell you what they should drive. I think they should just drive the best guy they feel like that you know, fits the mode of our team and where we're trying to go. 
Of course, there was no question that Rashad White was more excited to answer than about his good old buddy Chase Edmonds that's back yeah. with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This is what he said about his overall friendship with Chase Edmonds. Uh, huge, huge, huge. Uh, huge for my career. Great, great guy. Look at my smile. Like, I smile about him like, you know, like we dating or something, but we not. <laughs> you guys went on vacation? Like, yeah, 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 that's, that's, cool. my guy. that's my guy. That's my guy. That's my guy. That's my guy for sure. And uh, man, huge. He's been huge. Uh, great vet, great leader. Uh, not just on the field, man, just off the field. And what he do and what he has done and brought uh, to my life and uh, a lot of opportunities and just picking his brain. Like, I, I mean, I'm probably like for sure the no, annoying little brother. We run in sprints and I'm out there like talking and I see him trying to catch his breath, but I'm just annoying him talking a lot. But uh, it's just good. That's a great relationship. And uh, that's one for life. That's one for life for sure. What's, what's... I also, as we kind of put a bow on Rashad White's press conference, Adam, I thought it was interesting when he was talking about um, – Watching tape, and obviously he's watching tape of himself, but in yeah. conversations with Liam Cohen, talking about like using Rashad White similarly to how Todd Gurley was uh, in his prime, obviously with the Rams, spent a little time with the Falcons, but really his his uh, his main work was with the Rams. Do you see a comparison at all between Rashad White and Todd Gurley, or is it just kind of more of like, hey, he did this, you can do that? And we're going to use it in somewhat of a somewhat similar like playing field. Well, it may not be the most apples to apples comparison, like taking Gurley and White. I do see like some parallel in their games, uh, just based on the fact that they can both be explosive. I think you saw that with Gurley when he was in his prime. He was the best running back in the NFL for a couple of seasons. Yeah. And just the way that the Rams utilized him uh, as both a runner and a receiver. I think you can kind of use that blueprint take it to Rashad White, and have good results. Have a more efficient season this year from Rashad than last year. I I definitely think with implementing the zone run scheme, kind of keeping that and like the continuity along the offensive line, there's a lot of reason to see success for Rashad White, kind of drawing from that girly comparison. Yeah, I still think there's just a lot of meat on the bone for Rashad White. And yeah. yeah, maybe he's not exactly like Todd Gurley, but you know, if he's a top five running back all around, not just in all purpose yards, that will be a great thing for the Bucks. I just did, of course, training, but the biggest thing is just watching, watching, like you guys said, what I did second half of the season. Um, I mean, I, obviously, the second half of the season stretch helped me and put me in position to be a 990. I was way more efficient running the ball and. Um, you know, that's on all of us, but I take a lot of pride and say majority was on me. Uh, so that's just the biggest thing right now. I've been learning, be trying to figure out right now, not where I want to be in my career, yards per carry, things like that, just being an efficient running back. So uh, I think that's the biggest for me. Next step is, okay, he efficient. You know, obviously the efficient running backs over the land of time. I, like I said, I study the game a lot. and They average at least four, four, one above, things like that. Guys like Walter Payton, and, you know, it's tough. It's hard. Everybody has seasons. They have had seasons where they average three. Uh, y'all, three point some yards per carry, things like that, due to whatever circumstances. But for me, my biggest thing is just studying the game, just understanding it, and and being efficient this year. I always appreciated that Rashad's like a big time student of the game. He knows a lot yeah. of stats. He knows his own stats, and not in like a selfish type of way. So it's always pretty cool. He's a off the field. He's a very easygoing guy too. Always keeps the vibes high. Like we like to keep the vibes high with all the different vibes that Celsius Energy drinks. Have. Of course, Celsius is the presenting sponsor of the Pewter Report podcast and pewterreports.com. Check out all their great flavors, some of their new ones, the Galaxy Vibe and the Astro Vibe. My personal favorite vibe is the Arctic. Uh, can't go wrong with the Tropical or Peach either. Cosmic Vibe, fantastic as well. So if you want to try out a Celsius and you haven't had one before, go to the Celsius store locator on your website on their website if you need to find out where to go get one. Well, it'll tell you the closest location where you can pick one up. Could be a Walmart, Target, 7-Eleven, Health and Fitness store, or maybe it's at your bodega. Bodega. And once you keep going to your bodega and you're like, I love this, but I need to get it in bulk so I'm not making a 1,000 trips. We understand, and we got you because you can – Buy it in bulk. I recommend getting that variety pack so you can enjoy all the different flavors of Celsius. And go to Amazon Prime, click on the subscribe and save, and you can have it sent to your place of residence 
whenever you want. Could be a week, month, quarterly, or yearly. You're the captain. You're in charge. Send it to your place of residence and just enjoy Celsius, the official energy drink of pewterreport.com. And also, if you go to Pewter Report's website or check it out on our social media, we plugged it a couple times. We'll continue to as well. You can buy it straight off of Amazon, straight off of that link off of pewterreport.com. Buy anything off of Amazon as well. It doesn't just have to, just have to be Celsius, you just your regular shopping. And if you do that, it'll help out Pewter Report as well with some behind the scenes advertisement type of stuff. So you want to support Peter Report? If you're going to buy, be buying stuff on uh, Amazon to begin with, just do it with the link from Peter Report and help PR and do your regular shopping. So certainly would appreciate that if you guys could get doing so. And like I said, we appreciate everybody. All the Peter people had a very nice turnout once again for a roll call. So Adam, why don't you tell us about some of the people that were watching today, where they were watching from. Yeah, so we have quite a few uh, good ones here. Kieran uh, from Norwich, UK. Yeah. We got uh, Jay, the movie collector from Galveston, Texas. Shout out Mike before. Evans. And yeah, Simon Mike Evans. Collins. Yep. I uh, got a fellow New Yorker here, KGH for life from Nyack, New York. Yes, I thought you were going to say it wrong, but you said it correctly. So well done. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy Lowe from Tampa, Florida. Welcome back, Big Will. If you didn't see Will Golston resign with the team. Uh, Ivan here from Maputo, Mozambique. Finally made it to roll call again. Go Bucks. Got Thanks one last for watching, one for Ivan. You. Uh, Foxy Rose from Gainesville, Florida. Awesome. Awesome. So people from all over the place. We got some late ones as well. Paul Bowen Ooh. from Prattville, Alabama. Happy belated birthday, Paul. I saw that comment the other day. Um, sorry, we didn't get to it at the time, but happy belated birthday and Tom P watching from Munich, uh, Germany. So once again, great turnout, appreciate all you guys and gals watching from really all over the world. It's, uh, it's truly great to see. So thanks for another fun turnout. Another fun time talking to Zion McCollum as well. And Adam, if I were going to ask you for Zion McCollum, what's the biggest area of improvement that he could have in your opinion, what would it be? I think the thing that stands out with Zion and an area he needs to improve is really being a playmaker. Uh, He's played 30 NFL games so far in two seasons has yet to get an interception. He's become, he's come. Oh, so close Uh, in the preseason last year. He had an interception, I think against the Ravens. And then uh, later in the season this past year, he almost had one and dropped it. So it's like, He's come so close. I think getting that interception, once he gets one, he's probably going to get a couple. And as he looks to maybe take a starting cornerback role this season, uh, if the Bucs don't draft one with a first-round pick, he really needs to become a playmaker. Uh, With Jamel Dean, he hasn't really made too much of a scene on the field the past two seasons getting (laughs) interceptions. But Zion, he has all the tools. He has the height. He has the speed, the size. He just needs to put it together and start producing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think taking the ball away, in my opinion, would be the biggest improvement that he needs to do with that. So we're going to play a couple of videos in a row. The first one is how can Zion get better at taking the ball away? Of course, there's the jugs machine, but we've heard Carlton Davis and Jamel Dean say that as well. For Zion, it's taking advantage of these OTAs training camp. And like you talked about the preseason where – you can take a couple of more risks when to jump on a route and jump and go after the football where, you know, if you are too aggressive and you miss and they're able to make a big play, it's only practice for the preseason. So it's not going to hurt you too much. So, so I talked a little bit about having or taking some calculated risks when it comes to it. You know, the defense you've, you've established yourself here. You pretty much started last year, right? With the snaps you played. Is, is this an off season where you can take some chances and really work on, jumping routes and, and, and coming up with some of those those takeaways in, in a in not not so do or die environment out there? Oh, that's a great way to put it. I mean, taking calculated chances is how you make plays in this league. And, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but I mean, I'm looking to fail and get better and fail and get better in OTAs and this type of environment is the best time to do that. And so, yeah, taking chances is the name of the game, my game, at least. So you've always been a confident kid. Then he talked about growing as a corner as well. 
Yeah, I mean, my confidence has grown, especially from my rookie year. And just looking at all the signs and everything seeming to point in the direction of how I viewed and how I wanted to go. I mean, I'm super blessed for the coaching staff and the front office for putting me in the position that I have been in. And it's seeming like the opportunity is starting to grow and I'm growing as a person as well with my confidence, with my play on the field. So it's just a really good reassurance and it makes me feel good, you know, in my head to sleep at night. So I'm just curious, how different was your off season last year compared to how it is this year or is it similar? I got married. That's the main, the main big difference, but I mean, in terms of off season, since I got into the league, I mean, rookie year, you focus on like 40s and combines and stuff. But these past two years, I've just been able to focus completely and solely on football. And the more snaps I get in a season, then the more fine tuned my training can become. So when I go in the backyard with my brother, you know, I'm telling him the exact routes that I want him to run on me or we're practicing exact coverages that we expect to run. And so everything's just becoming more and more specific year in, year out. You had the unique opportunity. Now, if I was going to say how Zion McCollum got better compared to his rookie year to year two. One of the biggest things I would say is overall was his tackling. Yes, yeah. he had better coverage. His speed was up to uh, up to par. You played both sides of the field, just seeing the game better. These are all improvements that I would agree with. But tackling, I think, was where he had the biggest glaring issue as a rookie that he really cleaned up um, last year, especially getting a lot more playing time. So... He made a comment on improving that tackling as well. It improved when I just finally learned how to tackle, to be honest. In college, I think I'm just running out full speed and leading with my head. And, you know, I hope that he goes down, basically. And my rookie year, missing a lot of tackles, it was like, uh, that doesn't really work here. And so just learning to use my shoulders, to wrap up, to stay on my feet, to know that I don't have to be 100 miles an hour to every play. I just have to play at my speed and let the game come to me just made everything open up, not just tackling, it's kind of everything that starts. Zion, yeah. Adam, curious to get your thoughts when it comes to, while it looks like it's going to be Zion and Jamel, we can see what happens in, in training camp. But the fact that this year you'll have Antoine and Jordan Whitehead, how much can great play at safety help out these corners when they're in a little bit of a transition period? Not all the way, but a little bit. Um, I, I, I kind of just think shoring up the back end at safety can actually do a lot more for the corners as well. Yeah, Matt. I'm actually glad you asked that because uh, Scott Reynolds, he had a new story on PeterReport.com. Go check it out. But one point that he made that I really liked is when he mentioned the fact that the Bucks really have a fast and furious secondary. As you mentioned with Antoine Winfield and Jordan Whitehead, kind of being furious, you know, Antoine yeah. Winfield forcing six fumbles last year, Jordan Whitehead known for being a big hitter. And then you got the fast part, Jamel Dean, Zion McCollum. I think that both of those dynamics, having those big hitters and those playmakers kind of supporting two fast guys and Jamel Dean and Zion McCollum overall, I think it can blend really well. I think there's already a lot of chemistry there based on the fact that Jordan Whitehead, Hey, he's played with Jamel Dean, Antoine Winfield mm -hmm. Jr., and then Zion McCollum, he's very much like Jamel Dean in terms of size and speed. So I think together, it's going to be a good recipe for success. Not going to lie. Now I feel like watching the Fast and the Furious. Right. <laughs> too fast and furious. Too fast, too furious. Uh, yeah, let's get to some more of his comments. Sky is the limit. I mean, that's the main thing. Everybody just staying healthy, staying focused one day at a time. But I mean, the sky's the limit. The athleticism is there. And I think they did a really good job of putting like minds yeah. on uh, on this defense and on the field so we can talk to each other and there's no drop off yeah. in communication exactly. And I'm excited. I mean, as a corner, you would want to play with all pro safeties. Yeah. Uh, sure. safety. So knowing that, you know, Antoine's back there and now Jordan's back there, he's been in this system before. I mean, I'm super excited. It's just, I feel like we can just let loose. in terms of where you want to get better? Becoming a playmaker. I mean, for me in college, I was always known for getting my hands on footballs and making plays, whether it be forced fumbles or interceptions. And so that's the next point in my game is to start making those big plays. Are you like, how can that help you? Oh, 100%. I mean, since play, playing safety and playing nickel, I know exactly where I want my safety and my nickel to be because I can put myself in their shoes. 
And so with that, I mean, when we go out and we're practicing drills, you know, we can communicate at just such a high level because I can speak their language and they can speak my language and vice versa. And just being able to know exactly where somebody's gonna be when both call the call just allows me to just say, I don't have to cover that. I just have to worry about this. And giving them the reassurance that they don't have to cover the routes that I'm responsible for. Just worry about doing your job. So I think it all goes hand in hand. We have another story coming out on pewterreport.com. I believe it's coming out tomorrow or the next day, but another one about Zion. In a separate way that Zion has gotten better, Adam, I think it's playing against a certain wide receiver. Uh, it's your story that's going to be published. So you want to preview that a little bit? Yeah, just a little bit. So uh, the receiver he's alluding to is Mike Evans. Going up against Mike Evans, you know, the 11-year vet, he knows a thing or two about what it takes to be a great wide receiver. And with that, he's given young defensive backs fits and practice. Uh, but Mike Evans, he isn't one to give out pointers and say, hey, you need to do this, you need to learn that. He's like, hey, you're going to go up against me? You're going to watch and learn, pretty much. And yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to put in that work to really become good. So connecting that back to Zion, I think he's prepared a lot the past two years uh, going from year one to two, as you mentioned, improved as a tackler. And last year, he really improved in the aspect of learning what it takes not to just be a cornerback, but also play in the nickel, uh, even getting some snaps at safety. He's kind of learned uh, the trick of the trade in Todd Bull's defense. So heading into this year, he just needs to take that big step forward and put everything that he's learned really into play. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Being able to compete against the best in practice is what makes everybody great on the field during the game. And having a guy like Mike Evans, I mean, I'm taking advantage of every I guess I get, get against him, whether it's one-on-one, seven-on-seven team. I mean, I have to get those reps. And so I look forward to the matchup with not only him, but Chris and a lot of the other guys that we have. But Mike being his, going to 13th year or 14 years, I mean, it's unbelievable. And so I cherish every moment I have being able to go against a guy like that. Yeah, physical at the point of attack. The, you can't wait for anybody or anything in this league. You have to go and get everything that's out there. Nobody's going to let anything go into your laps. And so Mike, seeing a young guy, I mean, he's not waiting to give him tips or to tell him how to do something. He's just going to beat him, and then you'll learn from the work. So with him, when you line up against him, you don't think, oh, it's Mike Evans or, oh, I'm in the NFL. You think, what am I going to do to win the rep? And uh, last video we'll have from Zion is what the message from his coaches have been for not just him, but for the defense this year. To the defense today or in your room, Kevin Ross to the cornerbacks. Really, it's just consistency and showing up every day and doing something and not being good, but being great. And what he means by that is just, I mean, if we're doing everything that we're going to need to do in training camp right now, by the time we get to training camp, we're going to be that much further ahead. And so it's not just watching film just to watch film. It's watching film and treating like you're still in a season. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we were in this building in a season fighting for a playoff spot, fighting to get to the Super Bowl. So we can't lose that fire, that intensity. We can stack these years instead of just starting over every year. Is that Coach Bull? And speaking of being great, when it comes to the home buying and selling experience, you want to work with a great realtor. There's nobody better than Eric Gross and the Eric Gross Realty Group. It takes a full team effort to win a football game, and it takes a full team effort to win in real estate. The Eric Gross Group has done hundreds of transactions in this crazy real estate market and has the experience in all types of situations. Eric is an avid Pewter Report reader and a Tampa native whose father was stationed at the McDill Air Force Base. He and his team have the market knowledge, top-notch communication, and commitment to excellent service that sets them apart. With their strong team of vendors and a network of 85,000 agents, the Eric Gross Group will turn your dream of buying or selling a home into a reality. Their clients are not just transactions. They are lifelong friendships. So don't let the stress of buying or selling a home keep you out of the game. Let the Eric Gross Group take the pressure off. Find them on Facebook and Instagram at Eric Gross Group. Check out their website, housesinfla.com, or give them a call at 513-907-4271. That's housesinfla.com, or give them a call at 513-907-4271. No matter where you are in your homeownership journey, you'll feel welcome with Eric Gross, 
the Eric Gross Group, the official realtor of PewterReport.com. We got one more player to talk about, and that is Kalijah Cansey, the Bucks' first round pick from a season ago, a dominating force along the defensive line. Adam, what was your biggest takeaways from hearing from Kalijah Cansey today? Well, my first takeaway was that first picture you had up. That was his favorite quarterback, ladies it and gentlemen, was, Jared yeah. Goff, a guy he faced uh, two times last season. Uh, but otherwise, when talking about Kalijah Kansi, I don't think there's a player that's going to benefit most on this Bucks roster. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Getting another full offseason than Kalijah Kansi. Because when you look at last year, he missed training camp. He missed the first four games of the regular season. It's almost like a what could have been because when yeah. he was on the field, he was so good for a rookie defensive lineman. That's probably one of the hardest positions to learn as a rookie coming in, having to play alongside Vita Vea. So getting that full offseason to really work with Vita, work with Will Golston now and Logan yeah. Hall, I think he's going to benefit a lot. And then as well as that, also building up his strength and getting even stronger and learning the system. The sky is the limit not just for the secondary, but also for Kalijah Kansi. Yeah, he admitted, like, he was very uncertain if he could kind of, like, keep it together with everybody because he started so much later than everyone else because of that calf injury. And we've seen how that affected Zion McCollum a couple seasons ago, Scotty Miller back in the day as well. But he did say that he thought that he was able to catch up by the end of the season. A lot about myself um, was a little, like, was a little uncertain um, starting off as far as being set back with the calf injury and um, starting the season off a little late. Uh, I, I was, my main thing was getting back to myself how I was in college. Like I wanted the NFL to be as easy as college and it came with patience and I, I had to learn uh, a different scheme. I want to get better in guys who've been in the league for uh, a lot of years. Um, I just had to. I had to get the repetition, and when I got the repetition, it's just all starting to pick up, and and that's where I want to be at. Uh, I want to just work off of why why I finished off at and be better. At, at the end of the season, or did you feel like you finally have a chance now to be a second? Yeah, I player? definitely feel like I, I caught up at the end. Um, I, w I was playing a little bit of catch up, but I mean. It all worked out for me. Um, it helped me learn my body, and it helped me uh, just not take take this for granted because it'll be taken away from me very fast, and just made me love the game even more. Now the whole Jared Goff thing, obviously the Bucks lost to them twice, but Kalaja Kansi essentially started and ended his season playing against the Lions because he yeah. got he played a little bit in that first game against the Vikings, but then returned for the game against Detroit and he had a sack in that game. And I believe he had a sack as well in that playoff game. So while the, uh, the lions have given the box some issues, Kalasha can't see likes playing against Jared Goff. Sack and Goff in each game. What, you think about that last game and how the season ended and what type of taste that might leave in your mouth. I think golf, my favorite quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> COVID not. Um, yeah. With that, with that um, being the first and my last game, uh, it was really, it's really like a, a, get, a get back revenge um, tour type of thing. Uh, really just seeing him um, go against him for the first time and us like as a team not pulling away with that win. And even the second time of um, not winning again, uh, just that's that's something we want to do. We want to finish the game. And it was, a, it was, um, I will say he's a great quarterback as well. Um, just want to get some. He's smart. He could feel when pressure is close out. It was times he got the ball up when I was mad. I should have got him, but it was a great experience. And you can see him again this year too. Yes. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to it. I think what's I just noticed from the press conference today with Kalijah Kansi is he definitely looks a little more comfortable. He definitely yeah. seems a bit more open because – the next video I'm about to play, I don't know if he would have said this at the end of the year, but now that he's been in Tampa for another season, he's technically no longer a rookie anymore. Um, like even just had that little quip about Jared Goff being his favorite quarterback and stuff like that. You didn't necessarily see that from Kalijah Kansi. I just think it's a matter of 
one playing so well like he did last year and um, getting a full season in Tampa underneath him and ready to go for year two. Honestly, it's really um, looking forward to what we got ahead of us this year. Um, just knowing last year we should have been way better and could have been way better. Um, and it was times where we shot ourselves in the foot, um, just messing up mentally. Um, so that's what we want to be. We want to be stronger mentally, and that w- that way it carry us throughout the season. We started now. Coach Rogers, what is it was pretty much the same thing. We went over a couple a couple um, plays. We gave up as a defense, um, explosives, and we just kind of like like called out all the little things what we messed up at and hurt ourselves rather than the other team just flat out just beating us. So it was really just working on ourselves. There's, no, there's another rookie you had a, a strong connection with last year, not just Servassier, but, but um, Yaya Diaby. Talk yeah. about the bond that you two have had being similar like minds in terms of your approach to football and your seriousness. and. And when did you guys start first started clicking? Uh, we definitely uh, started clicking uh, rookie minicap, honestly. Um, and as we started to get more reps together on the field, it just the bond just grew like stronger and stronger. And that it, that way, it just carried us throughout the season. That was one of the answers of Kalijah Kansi talking about some of his teammates. He had two other teammates that he mentioned as well. First, Vita Vea. I learned a lot from Vita, uh, just being in a room with him, being on the field with him. Uh, my first day, I actually took a rep with him. He told me everything to do before I even before we even got out the huddle. I'm like, damn, is that easy? And <laughs> like, just that just lets you know like what type of guy he is. He's on top of everything, like. He knows the formation. He knows what to expect. He knows the type of the person we're going against because he's been in the league and he's going against like everybody. So it's really a plus for me. Um, and then going into this year, uh, just really following his steps and, and and being a staunch towards him because he does everything the right way. Was it that easy? Uh, at, at times it was, but you still got to go out there and do it. He could, he could tell me everything to do. I still got to do it. So it wasn't that easy. And then he spoke about his former Pitt teammate, current Bucks teammate, Servassier Dennis. And it's heading into his second season. He made a lot of improvements on uh, being able to get some snaps uh, later on in the season, but also being there for us on special teams. I think he'll be a, he'll, uh, a great addition to the defense this this year as well. What's his best trait as, as a football player? In your opinion, you played with him at Pitt and not last year. Um, he's smart and he, he's relentless. Like he, he wants to go out there and make a play. He wants to win a rep and he wants to win. And speaking of Servassier Dennis, he is going to be on with us for tomorrow's Peter Report podcast at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Very excited to have Servassier on the show. He's going into year two with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So we'll certainly uh, want to know about his overall experience in his first season with Tampa Bay, what he's working on this off season and uh, what his plans are for this upcoming year in Tampa Bay. So Servassier Dennis joining us on the show tomorrow at four o'clock, of course, in a little over a week from now, we're going to have the Peter report live draft show. We'll be doing it for all three days, but it starts On Thursday, April 25th, we go an hour before the game starts um, at 7 o'clock Eastern. We'll see who the Bucs pick in the first round. A lot of options there. Yeah, a lot of options, and you can find it all on our YouTube channel. So please like and subscribe. Before we get out of here, we'll play one more video from Kalijah Kansi. His biggest goal heading into this season. Your, your biggest goal this off season for you personally in terms of your physical development, your continued you know, quest to become the, the best athlete you can be, and then also in the film room about getting better from a technique and understanding the defense standpoint. Uh, my biggest goal this off season, honestly, is just to go back and look at everything where I could have been better. Uh, some, some like a play where I c- could have made the play and didn't make it, and just, just really just boiling up everything um, as far as my moves, my get off, um, my play recognition, everything, running to the ball, just kind of just kind of like working off of what I've already did and being better at it. 
Um, going into this off season, I'm definitely working more on um, just being able to share guys easily um, and be more violent. Uh, I think that was my biggest problem, uh, just getting guys off of me, uh, really, and just killing, using the speed to, uh, in the run game as well, uh, and just continuing to play violent, honestly. We had great stuff from all the Bucks players today. So shout out again to Rashad White, Sai McCollum, and Kalijah Cansey. You can find a lot of videos from today's press conferences on all of our social media, on X, Facebook, and Instagram. We are at Peter Report. And our YouTube channel is Peter Report TV. If you like the podcast we do four times a week um, or the various clips we put up on YouTube and various uh, opinions and reaction pieces as well, Please follow us at Pewter Report TV. Like and subscribe. Leave a comment on this video as well. We're trying to grow our numbers and followers as much as we possibly can. So please do so. This is going to do it for us on today's show. So for Adam Slavon, I'm Matt Matera saying thanks everybody for watching. And we'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. with Servasier Dennis on the show for another edition of the Pewter Report Podcast. Out. Out.